Okay, and welcome to the 21st edition of Techno Crime Fighter Forum. This is going to be an action. We've been talking already, and it's uh, getting, it's warming up to be a very exciting podcast. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Paul Marco, and this is my compañero, uh, Mindy Erkin. She's always here. She's always producing these things. And uh, we've decided to have, give her more of a, a visual role in, in subsequent programs. Also, she's created a website that I want to, her to share with you. Joining us today are going to be our normal joint investigation team, which consists of uh, Ramola D, who is a true journalist. If you want a model of a true journalist, someone who is not afraid to say it the way it is, it's Ramola D. We have Dr. Catherine Horton. She's a particle physicist, but I'm all very impressed with her work with organizations and understanding management and how that works. We also have Millicent Black. Now, Millicent Black is a, is a reluctant expert on uh, V2K, chipping, and everything. Uh, She's, she's a very strong member of the team, but she won't be here till much later. She has an appointment. Also, we have Karen Milton Stewart, who is a, uh, what she call herself, a reluctant, uh, she calls herself an accidental whistleblower, which is what I think most whistleblowers end up being. So they're going to be coming on and they're going to be contributing. Also, sometime in this hour, hopefully, we have Dave Gabatz. And uh, he's going to be a real interesting character, and hope we can get him on as soon as possible. I went to his blog, and uh, so I was pretty impressed. You know, the, the old saying that, uh, you know, if you don't stand for anything, you can fall for anything. If you don't stand for anything, you can fall for anything. How does that go? It sounds like George Bush. <laughs> uh, but anyway, his website, there's a strong presence of a guy who stands for something there. And I'm really uh, looking forward to meeting him and getting involved in that discussion. Before we do, if you remember the last couple uh, Techno Crime Fighter forums, we started talking about other ways to escape the matrix. Um, and I used the left brain, right brain analogy. That's turning out to be not so strong. Uh, a better analogy is escaping the matrix like a, a rat climbing out of the maze or something like that. Uh, Mindy has spent uh, this week setting up a new blog spot and the blog spot's gonna be used for an ongoing open source investigation into these types of techniques that can give uh, the TIs that I, I'm, I'm calling them the selected, uh, can use to get some relief from this torture. Uh, so far, uh, the contributions have been mostly regarding increasing your vibration to a more love vibration, away from the fear and anger and that they want to put us in, and techniques, to, uh, techniques involving mindfulness, uh, which is a way to focus the attention of your brain and get it off. I, I know it gets it off of pain, but there's some other things, and Ramola and I were talking a little while ago about how she uses it sometimes. So uh, this website's gonna be available. We're gonna have the open source investigation. We're gonna have uh, a resource investigation. And then I'm gonna do a podcast on Sunday night starting at eight, eight o'clock Eastern time. Mostly questions, we'll have a chat room, and uh, if you wonder about it, you can you can contact us there. It'll be on Pinecone Utopia channel at eight o'clock Sunday, hopefully this night. Uh, Mindy, would you like to show them your? All right, I'm going to share the screen here and just show you what we have so far. Um, here we go. Here it is. Okay, so present it to everyone. There it is. This is our new Pinecone Utopia portal. And on the home page, you'll see a little description of what it's all about. And then we have basically three sections. One for research, which is 
All right, well, let me navigate. It doesn't allow us to move around. It doesn't? No. Oh. All right. Um, hmm. It might let you guys on. Let's see. Go to Pinecone Utopia portal and see if you can pull it up. Maybe it'll let you guys toggle okay. around. Okay. Well, I'll just show you from the home screen then. You'll see uh, these tabs, Research, Techniques, Discussion. On the research page is our open source investigation where people we're going to refer to you as the selected this really does apply to everyone whether you are selected to be in the program or not we think it's helpful for everyone um right in tell us about your technique that you use that works for you and uh and we'll share that on that page and then the techniques page will have teaching vignettes you know from various different teachers of different modalities that you can further delve into to practice. And um, let's this see. week, uh, by the way, I'm I'm going to interview uh, Oli Damagard, who has a a yoga practice that he uses, and he's going to tell me about that practice on Tuesday. So Tuesday afternoon, uh, it depends on whether we do it on Skype or or. Uh, that's right. If we if we do it on Skype, it may take a few days to produce. If it's uh, live on Hangouts, it'll be right there right away. So we'll see how that goes. And uh, the discussion tab will host our our uh, Sunday night talk show. That'll also be interactive. So that's our new format. And um, I'm sorry I can't flip around and show it to you. Actually. Um, um, so I feel like so I feel you're going to share your screen, okay? Yeah. That's yes. a great yeah. idea. I'm not sure if you can share So this is the this is here. here. Um, and okay. then there's research. So here's the open source investigation. Mindy has just... Um, uh, launched and here's the link um, for the ideas um, ideas for TIs um, down there and then I think what you mentioned was also techniques right. and I think there's a link already to um, the breathing techniques so there's already one instruction video I can see here um, that was that was sent in by a TI. Uh -huh. who it just the minute we got it up, and he shot that to me, and it's got not only what he does, the type of program he's in, but also here's an instruction how to get involved in that technique. Hopefully, we'll have hundreds. Wow, that's awesome! I mean, I can see there's lots of work already that went into this. That's so impressive. And then, um, I mean, here, wow, select language. I mean, that's that's professional. That's really cool. Um, and then down here, I guess this is what you mentioned just when I interrupted. That was the discussion session here. Right, exactly. So we will post our our subsequent talks on that page. And, and then use the contact page to uh, write us if you have something that you'd like to share. And we'll, you know, because this is an open source investigation. So these techniques, I mean, we can share many, many, many that we've studied through the years, mm -hmm. but we'd like to hear from, from you, from, from our listeners, what's working for you. And, uh, and then we'll compile the data and, and present it. Right, and I was thinking that another thing we could do as things go on, we might create a hypothesis as to how this is working, and then uh, set up a subsequent study to, to uh, I don't know, investigate the hypothesis. I think that's a, that's a super idea. And also, I've just discovered on the About page, you also give your email down here. So there's, um, you, people can email you, I guess, or they go directly to the contact form here. Exactly. Email is pineconeutopiaportal at gmail.com. Uh-huh, exactly. And that's here on the About page as well, down there, if people want to um, 
look at it again. That's really impressive. I love it. And I, I really love I love the, the background images. I mean, that's just so, so wonderful. I want to be there. <laughs> well, you're invited. You're invited. <laughs> but anytime. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your screen since I was unable to do it here. And so this is just getting underway and we hope you'll all participate and we'll see where it goes. All right, I'm going to go see what's going on in the chat room. Yeah, I, I think actually yeah. you should also post maybe the URL in the chat room. I, I tried, but I can't post URLs. So um, okay. actually yeah. stick the link in the chat because I think people want to click straight away. Um, but okay. that's, that's great. I mean, it's um, I, I'm, I'm really of the opinion that this will be one of the solutions. And then I also feel that um, if there will be anything positive coming out of this, all this terrorism and this calamity, mm -hmm. is that you know, as a as a human race, we ratchet to something else. You know, sometimes I feel like that progress is kind of going around in circles. So you kind of go down. You know, it's almost like the wheel of fortune. You know, that applies to the whole of humanity. You kind of go down and then you go back up again. But I think in terms of progress, every single time you go down, eventually you end up much higher. So it's kind of like a looping upward trend. And we're in this yeah. whirlwind right now of going down, but we have to really push back so that with our collective energies, we end up much better. And you know what? I was I was musing to myself that what I can already see happening is that these banks are being wound down. I mean, um, it was Ronald Burnett who came forward and he said um, he, he reported about all the Satanism and the rituals in the banking industry and so on. And um, at the same time, there are many people who are already pushing for a new type of bank. So they are trying local banks, they're trying local currencies um, and um, you know various models. Digital currencies are tried as well. And I think a certain ad admixture is a good idea for international transactions. Personally, I, I would not recommend putting your entire economy onto um, digital currencies, which is I think what the globalist, the cartel holders want to do because um, I, I actually think that's a very, very bad idea because then your entire global architecture is on the most fragile systems we have because these computer systems are, they are not reliable. Um, I mean, I get hacked daily by the intelligence agencies. Just um, today, as I was um, finishing off a police report I submitted, I was again hacked. So I, I can see them hacking my open office document as I'm working on it. Now imagine they do that with your money. You know, do you want to have some GCHQ kid hacking your, your digital wallet and just helping himself to something? I don't think so. Yeah. Well, but, they really have you on a string with the digital currency. Yeah. And supposedly that's going to uh, be implemented next year. But I think that uh, in India, when they took away a lot of the different currencies, human beings step up to it and they acted like human beings. I wish we could get more information from what was going on over there. Uh, from a from a, a real journalist that was that was in that area and knew what happened because I think people are going to respond very differently than they. That's why they always do beta tests. They don't understand us. Um, they have to beta test everything so that they can see how we're gonna we're gonna react. And if we react unexpectedly, if we react like humans, I think we're going to be much better off. And I think that's what happened in India. But of course, you're not going to hear about it on the mainstream media. Uh, all you hear about is, you ready for 5G? Here we come. Uh, we're going we're gonna to give you such fast internet that uh, it's going to know what you're asking before you ask it. Actually, they already have that. It's something but, to uh, investigate, I think. Yeah. Exactly. We're both thinking so. Hint, hint, Ramola. I think you should take a summer holiday. <laughs> no, it, it is time for a summer holiday. I haven't had one in ages. So I should probably go home to India. There's so many things we've thrown on Ramola to do. Oh, He's boy. Carrying. You know, I have to say, though, I'm sure there are Indian journalists out there that are actually working on it. And so what I need to do is actually explore a little bit to find the alternative journalist in India, um, you know, that we don't hear about because we are stuck over here. Uh, yeah. And the, the news is filtered out to us. So, yeah, so I'll look into it a little bit and try to find out what is happening. But you're right, India was kind of used as a kind of a test space, I think, 
for this whole project of converting people into converting the whole economy to a cashless economy and it's brutal because in india i mean think about think about you know the the strata the economic strata in india you have the little man with the toy sh the tea shop who trades in like a few rupees a day he's not going to have um you know a credit card he's not going to have thousands of rupees he's he's going to need to exchange uh, to do his daily transactions with 30 rupees or 50 rupees or whatever and i think they started by saying nobody beyond 500 rupees or 1000 rupees those were the limits those are still very small amounts you know so uh, you're not allowed to have more than that. And this is like when people start saving money for their daughter's weddings or something. They're going to save right. it in cash, you see. And so they don't, and some of them don't even have the banking um, philosophy. They don't even use banks. So they just have their money in a little sack at home, you know, or tied up in their saris. Yeah, so, I, I think that's the best way to do it. Because also, that's also a tradition, um, especially in the countries where your money wasn't safe. You would never entrust it with somebody else. You literally hung your money and your wealth around your neck. And for example, in Romania, the gypsy communities also do not trust banks. I mean, you know, say whatever you like about the gypsies. The gypsies have their own thing to say about the banking and us, you know. And there, literally, people would have gold in their teeth. Sometimes you see teenagers who have teeth taken out and replaced with gold teeth as an investment. And it used to be a sign of beauty and wealth when you had literally a, an 18 year old girl who had like, you know, a row of gold teeth. It, it's bizarre to us, but that's what they had to do. You know, you had to keep your wealth on you and also mm -hmm. necklaces and jewelry around your neck. Yes, and, and that's very color. Indian too. Yeah. And it's very, it's tr it's in traditional cultures, many traditional cultures, I think, not just India. I mean, it's very, very big in India, the whole gold thing. Growing oh, up, yeah. you're kind of drawn into that, you know. Gypsies um, are Indians. They are Indians. And oh, I thought they were Romanian. Oh, oh sorry. I, I, I was talking about the, the Romanians, yes, but sorry, what were you saying, Paul? They come up through India. They're Indians, originally. Oh, yes, that's true, actually. Yeah. Oh, they're that's Indians awesome. and they ended up in Romania. Okay, yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, they ended up all over Europe. They're amazing, uh, amazing group of people. Self-sufficient. They're not going to be in the Matrix, I'll tell you. I did a whole <laughs> yeah. podcast. Matrix, that's true, you know. I did a whole podcast yeah. on that actually, uh, on how they 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 want to uh, demonize gypsies in that lifestyle because that's an escape from the matrix. They don't live in the matrix. They live outside of the matrix. They never. That is very in interesting. Yes, I think that would also sort of that could feature also into your consciousness portal uh, focuses, don't you think? I mean, that kind of escape from the matrix kind of physically and get off it right. in other ways as well um i mean it would sort exactly. of i mean the way i'm thinking of course and i think i'm sort of stuck in the western paradigm of course i'm thinking well you might need solar panels or you might need your own electricity generator <laughs> i'm not right. thinking of candles and you know lanterns uh <laughs> you know going I'll back post, to the 18th century i'll post a video uh, below this one and anybody who wants to watch it can watch it um it shows pictures of of uh, the beauty of the of the uh, of the gypsies throughout Europe. Totally independent, they had a little house. The house was built into like a Conestoga wagon. Um, gave birth to Django Reinhardt, who's one of my old uh, idols. I don't know you know who that is. He invented gypsy jazz. If oh, you don't wow. know about gypsy jazz, no, I didn't know. Google it or do it on YouTube. You'll you'll be exposed to uh, the most well, probably one of the most delightful musical forms I've ever I've ever been involved with. Uh, but it's it's got its origin in India oh, wow. from the gypsy. So I'll I'll link that below and uh, I think and music is by the way another avenue out of the matrix. There's got to be ways to use music. Yes, definitely it. music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they're using music in the trance festivals to put you in the right brain. Trance, oh, yes. And that's another thing, isn't it? Trance, that whole aspect of trance, which can be arrived at through music. And, um, well, also I'm thinking mantra, you know, because mantra yoga, which is chanting, 
can put you into that state as well. But, right, but they're using trance. They're, they're, see, they're using the, uh, both sides. They're using trance, what they call Tomorrowland festivals throughout the world. And these Tomorrowland festivals, uh, I think they're like, uh, they're like 40 years or 50 years after Woodstock. You know, the, the, the generation that Woodstock gave us, which is my generation, uh, uh, the, uh, the moral decay and the, and the technological advances give you uh, Tomorrowland festivals now. Through, it's all over Europe and the United States. Happened all summer. I'm sure there's one uh, within uh, 200 miles of you, uh, Catherine. And it's this trance music gets you out of your mind in a bad way. They get you into mm -hmm. these trances, and then oh, it's okay. all about mind control. I was going to uh, say it sounds a bit like mind control. If you're talking about a network of festivals, I've got my antenna up immediately. That sounds like you know the globalists at it again. You know, trying to take over the world and zombify the entire population. Yeah, that's that was my. That was my mistake with the right left brain. I always associate the left brain with lack of structure. But there's a problem with lack of structure right too. Brain. Right brain with lack of structure. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, they're using both sides. But I don't think they can they don't think they can map the right side, but we're finding better better ways to delineate what we're trying to do. Uh, mm -hmm. mindfulness, uh, I've had uh, Ramola this person know me. I don't know whether it's a male or a female. Definitely uh, has sent us stuff. And I had somebody write last night. I'm glad you're getting into this. She uses this air and something else she was saying. Hopefully she'll be listening and she'll send to pinecone utopia portal dot gmail. Uh, and we'll be able to post that one uh, as soon as we can. Anyway. One thing, all of the, uh, many of the techniques, well, everybody has in it the potential for its pure goodness, its original intent, and the corruption of it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we're able to discernment because you could that the techniques that we're going to propose as being worthwhile have also been corrupted and can be a, a bad way to go. So I, I'm not sure I'm explaining this very well. Yes, but everything can be corrupted. Yes. It doesn't mean that since it is corruptible and has been co-opted that it can't still be used for good, which was its original intent on speculating. Right. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on this. There's nothing in this arena that's not corrupted. So you have to parse around. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it just me or am I? Um, I'm hearing like an audio delay and everything's being frozen and choppy. Is it just happening at my end or did anybody else hear that? I, I had difficulties hearing um, just Paul and Mindy just about literally just the last 20 seconds before it was fine. Um, yes. Mel Catherine's audio is, is a little delayed. Well, you yeah, know. Not for us at this end. Sometimes it's clear and other times there's a feedback. Well, I find it rather significant that here you are talking about these sort of esoteric and exotic and extraordinary solutions that, you know, normally people do not start sit around talking about, especially among people who are being targeted with electromagnetic weapons. And uh, at this point, your audio is being cut off and chopped. It suggests to me, perhaps, that what you're talking about is extraordinarily important you know, is sort of supremely important and they don't want people to hear this. And I rather suspect that myself because of, you know, my own experiences, as I was telling Paul before we started, with conscious breathing, you know, and if you want me to go into it, I can go into it right now a little bit. Yes. Okay. My my experience with, um, thank you, thank you, Paul and Mindy. So <laughs> I don't want to just sort of take over and start going. Um, it must be important. Somebody muted me. 
So, uh, so what I wanted to mention was conscious breathing, and I've mentioned it to a few people, you know, who are being hit with microwave weapons, and I don't know if anyone's tried it, but I can tell you for one, um, for, from my point of view or from my experience, it's definitely worked for me, and it seems to work big time, and I'll tell you why. Because I am extremely closely monitored, surveilled, and uh, focused on to an extreme degree, much like Catherine and many others, to the extent that not only are there people in the houses nearby who appear to be on call and focused on working on these uh, surveilling, monitoring, and tracking and hitting me with weapons activities. But there is also always, right from the beginning of my targeting, a group of cars that goes by up and down the street, you know, around the block. And they seem to do it in shifts. And they, they, they seem to move up and down the street based on my location within the house, whether I'm in the front of the house or going to the back of the house, whether I'm in the kitchen or the living room or up in my bedroom or whatever. You know, the cars go up and down they zo and they're zooming. They're going at high speed. And I have done foyers about this. I've asked the local fusion center about it. I've asked them if they have contracts with the neighbors because they go and park in the neighbor's driveways. And then they, you know, fine tune their little tracking and then they are fine tuning their hitting from there. So I'm convinced that I am indeed being hit from these cars, um, but I could also just be tracked from the cars and the hitting may be coming from another direction, you know, so I don't really know. But in any case, I have found that when I engage in conscious breathing, and literally all that means is you take in a breath and you're very conscious you're taking in a breath because, you know, this is almost an involuntary process. We kind of breathe without even thinking about it, right? So is that mindful breathing that you're talking about, um, Paul and Mindy? It's probably the yeah. same thing, right? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're very mindful. You're just taking an in-breath, and you're aware you're taking in an in-breath, and then you're aware you're exhaling, and you do this. And by the way, it gets easier. In the beginning, it's kind of hard because you can do it for like a minute or so, but then as time goes on, you get better and better at it. Now I can do it pretty much any time all through the day. And it's becoming a second habit, you know, with me. And it's great because I'll tell you what happens. As soon as I start conscious breathing, they lose their lock on me or whatever it is. They start going up and down the street like rabbits, honking, <laughs> and zooming up and down, <laughs> making quite a to-do. Before you know it, the little planes are out because they're honking for the planes, you know, they're back up. The planes or drones or whatever they are, they're, they're these small single engine planes, you know, they start coming over. So then you've got the planes coming over my couch. And before you know it, the helicopters have to come out. So then it the <laughs> doesn't work. I'm still doing my conscious breathing. The cars go up and down again. <laughs> and then <laughs> they give up and they start the neighbors, you know, the power mowers and the water cleaners and the <laughs> grass trimmers and the whatever they're using, their power equipment, their power saws. And they do it in a circle. And then they, they get the kids to come out and make a big hoo-ha outside my window in front. So all of this noise harassment simply is up to up immediately as soon as, you know, I do the conscious breathing. And the great thing is I have relief. I'm not being hit with microwaves. I'm not being blasted because they can't lock on to me, you know. And so that's the way in which I've figured out that it works. <laughs> So that's the story that I wanted to tell. I just wanted to tell people, you know, it seems to work for me. And every time I do it, yeah, they're bringing up the noise harassment. But these days, the noise harassment just makes me laugh because it's so obvious. <laughs> and I can film it. And, and by the way, for, for, to everybody who thinks that literally people bringing planes out to harass people sounds in, improbable. Um, Ramona and I, we were working several times, you know, over the last couple of weeks, and every single time Ramona goes out on her porch, yes, there's a helicopter bus. Yeah. And I was able to show it to you, right? It was either a helicopter or the small plane. And, uh, you know, crossing the chemtrail aerosol sky directly above my backyard. So... And, and that, that, that's impressive. I mean, here in Switzerland, this is, it's very funny because all the Americans complain about the noise harassment. And the noise harassment wasn't here in Switzerland. I've never experienced it ever. And I think that's because all these German speaking countries, I mean, probably in, in French speaking Switzerland, it's different. But here in German speaking uh, regions of Switzerland and also in Germany, as soon as there's the slightest noise above the wisp of a mouse, people call the police. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> you see, that's what we need. Noise, noise complaints is number one in German-speaking countries. So, you know, they can make all the noise they want because I'm Eastern European, so I don't really care. You know, I'm from a Balkan country. I'm used to, like, neighbors screaming and <laughs> almost killing each other next door. That's normal. Like, you know, Mexico. My Mexican friend said, noise. <laughs> There's no noise complaints in Mexico. Everything is loud, you know. <laughs> But yeah, in Switzerland, it's like, oh, my God. You know, so anybody... But in my neighborhood you'll have immediately 50 phone calls from neighbors you know, so. that's very interesting Catherine over here you know and the noise is all you know fusion center prescribed go out and make some noise and they immediately do you know so <laughs> that's what Massachusetts is all about and actually one of the great tips now that we're talking about solutions of how to actually cope I mean coping with electromagnetic attacks is very hard because they actually physically hurt you but uh, already most people get extremely disconcerted about the stalking and the intimidation and a really good one we found that it's extremely effective is that in your mind you force yourself every single time you see it to crack a joke about it like in your mind say something really you know funny or demeaning but actually you know train yourself to laugh about it because by now I go out in the streets and I literally am in giggles so um, one day I, Ramola told me about this um, sort of um, like um, uh, mapping or, or mirroring of colors that you wear. And by the way, I realized I also wear purple today, so I'm not purple, you Ramona. Oh, no, no, this isn't purple. This is, uh, you know, a kind of a darker maroon. Yeah, or something. Why do my laundry tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but anyway, and um, and one day I went out and I was literally, that was one of these, again, the last shirt in the public sort of days, and it was bright pink, but it's like, it's extremely bright pink and I went out and it's only it, that's the only time I noticed that they must have been mirroring me all the time but it passed me by and I went to the shops and I got to the first main road and there's a bus stop and already that's usually where the doctors are waiting for me. and there was this young chap wearing the, the brightest piggy pink shirt you can possibly have. and it was just like pink and just like patterns all the way to the top and Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it make you keel over? Now we've got the men all wearing pink because they're so desperate to um, mimic us and echo us. Actually, that was so funny. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think if they get laughter, I don't think that's the response they want. I, I have to say, laughter. you're right, you're right. And I've noticed when I'm out and about and I'm sitting there calm as a cucumber wherever and, you know, doing my work, reading my book or whatever, and I've got a smile on my face. I have to say the people around me and who the ones whom I suspect are either agents or working for agents start having the most incredibly sulky looks on their faces you know they're they're really bummed out <laughs> looking at me because it's clear that i'm not responding the way they would like me to you know i'm supposed to be in deep pain and you know sort of groaning and moaning all the time and i'm not doing that and um they they start looking very um worried very anxious and very stern looks on their faces so it's like okay i guess i'm I guess everything's working well here <laughs> Well, I think I think that that's uh, I think that with the uh, selected people I call TI selected because TI that's just a victim status that that's not going to help us. Uh, if uh, you can, if we can get the TIs to not react to this, uh, that's halfway out of the matrix, and you'll be able to look and. You'll be able to see things from a different perspective mm -hmm. if you're impervious to this. You know, you're, you're not going to you're not going to be annoyed by uh, your husband not cleaning the uh, dishes, or you're not going to be because you're uh, you're you've reprogrammed yourself to be kind of above it, if in a way, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it because. Um, it, that that's a very 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 good one. Not engaging with um, what they want, and if you if you can't, um, you know, for example, physical attacks are very ignored because they really get a lot of pain, but not reacting the way they want. That's um, correct, exactly. And you know, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing myself. And there's an echo. Oh, hi, Karen. Hi, hi. I guess we had questions for you, but um, we'll find out, I guess, when um, Paul Kovacs is joining us, if he is. I have been trying to get a hold of him, and I'm not sure he understood, because I told him 
he had to have a um, Gmail and a Hangout account for us to, to call him. And he sent me a phone number. And I've been trying to reach him, and I can't reach him right now. Oh, dear. So, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, sure, I'm not sure what's going on. All we need is his Gmail address, which I have. So when we're ready, I'll send him an invitation, and we'll wait and see if he joins us. But it's nice to okay. see you. I'm glad you've joined us. I hope you're well. Well, thank you. Uh, doing okay. Thank you very much. I just was, you know, trying to find him and trying to find what was going on and uh, trying to pill a large dog who has no desire to be pilled. Oh. <laughs> My God, you know, women, lesser women would have lost an arm in that exercise, Karen. <laughs> you know, credit to you. You won the battle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think I had, uh, with all the cats I've ever had, I think I have suicidal tendencies every so often. I try to bathe the cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That is, I have done that. I have done that, Karen. I have bathed my cats and almost lost my entire arm in the process <laughs> with all the clawing and the shrieking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, Karen, we were just talking about, you know, sort of um, getting past all of the things that they're throwing at us because they're throwing a lot of things at us and they're kind of doing it to stop us. You know, they're, they're doing it to stop us from speaking out or from writing and so forth. And I know all of us, the three of us in particular, have gone through this whole process of figuring out what we're being stopped for, or trying to figure out what we're being stopped for, and then and realizing that what the heck, you know, we're going to go ahead and keep doing what we're doing anyway. You know, we're here to expose them, right? So, um, and I've noticed, I was just telling, uh, I was going to tell uh, everyone that I've noticed that as soon as I write or uh, publish an article, that's particularly are painful for them to read, apparently. They come out in droves. I get incredible action on the roads. I get major COINTELPRO, major swarming. The helicopters are after me. The, the little planes are after me. And the grass trimmers are after me. You know, <laughs> the, entire, the entire army of Mossad appears to have been, <laughs> yes, <laughs> appears to have been unleashed on, on Massachusetts. <laughs> starts following me and I know that that's happening to you too so I in fact this week so this week what happened was we published your letter to the FBI infraguard right I put that on my website along with a few choice paragraphs of editorial content <laughs> from my own head because <laughs> of course I'm irrepressible in that way I can't stop myself from writing my thoughts <laughs> down <laughs> so <clears throat> As soon as that came icing out, icing on turned. the on the cake. Icing Thank on the cake. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> yes, it was the icing on the cake. And um, so, cutting through all that frosting and icing on the cake, major swarming on the roads. You know, I was driving into Cambridge the last few days and taking the tea, and I was majorly swarmed, and uh, given very strict looks, like from various people in cars, as they're turning past me looking at me very meaningfully and I'm thinking okay so you're FBI all right then <laughs> one for you keep reading that go back and reread every line of that you need to wake up you know we're not going to sit back and take the crap so <laughs> right. um, in, in our in our uh, experiments I should we shared a new website uh, Karen and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later about it individually or uh, you can watch the video or, you know, whatever. But we want to uh, find out uh, what type of uh, program they're in, you know, describe their, we want to find out what they're using to mitigate the effects of this program. But I was thinking as Ramola was saying something, do a beta test on them. How is, how are Great they Great idea, I love it. Because we'll just turn, we'll just do a beta test on them. If we can gather data on, uh, I don't know, mindfulness, uh, uh, random kindness, or whatever the technique is, how do they respond? And apparently, th with Ramola, they panic. They 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 throw out all the out all stops and see if they can get her out of this. Because, mm -hmm. uh, so I think that data is just as important as the other. By the way, if you're listening, let's we'll talk about it Sunday night too. 
that's a great idea. I think we should do that. And you could do it for each technique and just ask people to join us and report their experiences. But, but how they, how the other side reacts. Yes. Because we're doing a bit on them too. Yes, I mean, report so, the observations off the other side is what I meant, yeah. 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 So. I, I think it's uh, well. Uh, Ramola was talking about the, the. Go ahead. Oh, Ramola was talking about the mirroring of colors, and so I was going to say, you know, these ladies know. I've told them before. In two thousand nine uh, and after, I decided to go ahead and get a couple of um, uh, bumper sticker, et cetera, et cetera, shops. One of them is on. Uh, cafepress.com and these guys ticked me off so much I started making my own bumper sticker and bumper magnets to talk to these idiots who were following me so the ones I think that was most popular with people was the one that says driving slowly so my remedial stalkers can keep up <laughs> so I just basically made fun of them you know, Karen, I desperately want a, a, a T-shirt that says "Fashion Leader, Copy Closely," because they're doing it anyway. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. you said, I made it. Oh, you did? It's there. Oh, oh, I have to go look for it. I'm sorry. We should we should put the link out there so everybody can get that one. And and I think we should we should remember <laughs> that. Um, this sort of advertising, it actually works. It's hugely powerful. I mean, that's why all these sports advertisers use it, you know, T-shirt advertising. But also, I mean, Frederic Laroche, he, um, he uh, what's it called, um, you know, um, had stickers on his car, big stickers about um, stalking on his car. And that really annoyed the authorities because as he was yeah. riding out t around town, just parking it in front of shops, people kept seeing it and reading it. And they do mm -hmm. react to this. So I'm thinking what we should have is literally, um, you know, have your um, website in the, you know, a stick off your website in the back mirror, you know, everydayconcern.net. Oh, and I love that. I've never oh thought of God. making a sticker with my website name on it. I should do that. What a great idea. Exactly. And with a little with a little line of info below it, right? Exactly. Everydayconcern.net, yeah. a little more, you, uh, <laughs> you know, my latest uh, logo, right, Catherine? <laughs> <clears throat> it's like I wanted all of us on the JIT to have, you know, our names and then underneath it, a little smarter than the CIA or a little smarter than the NDB <laughs> and the MI5, a little smarter than the FBI, <laughs> you know. I think that's such a great tagline. We should, we should print it on mug as well. I'll let you know when they're done. <laughs> great. Karen, do you have a website that you sell these things through? Karen, do you have a website? Whoops, am I on? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, you are on. Um, one, I, I, there's kind of spread around. One of them is, uh, they're just shops on cafepress.com. One of them is, you, you do www.cafepress.com babble bomb, B-A-B-B-L-E-B-O-M-B. There are some. There are a couple other places, and I forget their exact addresses. But uh, you know, forgive me, people. I'm very much conservative, so some of the things on that side are conservative. If you're not conservative, ignore it and look for the uh, the stalking harassment. Uh, basically, entrees. You know, the, the basically uh, you can wear as t-shirts or put on your car as bumper magnets. I say magnet because I don't want to stick something on my car forever. So I've made magnets, but uh, if you have suggestions, so you say, hey, I really want a, a bumper magnet that says this or that, tell me, I'll put it right on there. That's, uh, I'd, wow. like to link, I'd like to link those sites on maybe our new, our new blog. So they can, I, I'm not sure that that's not a uh, Okay, I'll find, you know, solution. I'll find the other sites too, because, um, and stuff there. I was able to do more drawings a few years ago than I am uh, now because I'm not really set up for it. So I did a few drawings. Uh, you know, I made fun of the people. I drew them as idiots, you know, and I said, oh, because some guy told me to uh, NSA goon, you know, just things like that to make fun of these people. So I'll, uh, uh, I'll find the other site that was a few years ago. I was pissed. <laughs> 
And that was the first time my idiot neighbors were stalking and harassing me because NSA told them to. Uh, there wasn't any electronic harassment in 2009. So I was pretty free to make fun of these people any way I could. And I did so with signs oh. and bumper stickers and oh. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I love that, Karen. Because I don't have the street theater. I just have the directed energy weapon, you know. Yeah, and you know, I made a couple of fl flyers and I'm just, I've kind of fallen down on actually printing out those flyers and handing them out to people. But I'm thinking almost the flyer thing would also be a useful way to go just to, um, you know, put some information down and hand it out based on, you know, who the audience is, who the people are that you're handing it to. And that's something we could possibly work on. Uh, for instance, I notice these days they, they plant a lot of Indians around me. Okay, wherever I go, when I go to my daughter's swim meets at the swimming pool at the Y, there's Indian families clustering around me, staring at me, GPS pointing cell phones at me, you know, with disgusted looks on their faces as if they've been informed by the FBI in regard that I am somebody to be closely monitored, surveilled and kept an eye on because... I'm an Indian, I'm part of the Indian community, and I have to be trailed by Indians now. So yesterday, so the last few days, I was down in the Harvard area because my daughter's taking this class at the Harvard Swimming Pool. You know why that is? Sorry to interrupt. I think I just figured out why that is. It's because, it's because you dissed all the Mossad punks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lola and I yeah. had a private conversation and she really let you rip about all the Mossad guys. Yes, and I'm happy to replay that conversation, Catherine, because basically I was sort of getting into just now because the last few days my daughter's been at a swim camp and I'm, it's downtown in, at the Harvard Swimming Pool, at the Blodgett Swimming Pool, uh, you know, with signs that say Ivy League as you walk in, as you drive in. And... Uh, <laughs> So I've been in the Ivy League area lately, and um, lots of stories about that. But one of them, in relation to just this particular subject, is that I was trailed by a lot of people, and a lot of them were Indians. Okay, so we'd go, we went into a little the Boston tea shop for a smoothie for my daughter, and there was an, a young Indian woman sitting there and holding an extended conversation with a couple of young Nazis. Okay, I'm characterizing at this point, but this is my conclusion. Okay, a couple of young Nazis leaning forward and uh, engaging engaging in social engineering, speaking, uh, you know, and they have a manufactured directed conversation looking over at me all the time to notice my reaction. So it seemed completely put up. This kid seemed to be sitting there and having like a crisis acting moment. You know, the, the three of them were doing a little crisis acting right in front of me. I found it absurd. And then when I go to park my car, an Indian woman and her son get out at the same, same time. Now, I can tell you, I have lived in America for a very, very long time, almost 29 years, okay? And it's both in the Washington, D.C. area, which is awash with Indians, and now for the last five to six years in the Massachusetts area. Where there are also a lot of Indians, but not that many Indians, and not in my vicinity all the time. <laughs> It has simply amped up and ramped up. So then I go to Kumon after bringing my daughter home from swim camp because she loves math and she wants to do Kumon. And I go into the lobby and two burly Indian guys come in pointing their cell phones at me. You know, oh, they're just bringing their, their sons to Kumon and they happen to have a particular propensity for pointing cell phones at the other Indian woman sitting in the lobby. You know, and then keeping an eye on me as they go outside, standing outside by the porch railing and looking at me and pointing cell phones at me. So th these are classic stalking signs that classic FBI infraguard signs, just as Karen wrote about in her article. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to throw it out there. There's this sort of this organized stalking by community that's going on. What the heck are they being told, you know? Are they being told there is an Indian woman that is out of control, she's an extremist, right? She's not a journalist, she's not a writer, she's not a speaker, she's not somebody who's investigating what is going on and speaking out about it. She's an extremist. We have to keep an eye on her because she there is the potential for her to be radicalized and become what? A jihadist, a suicide bomber, a terrorist, you know, an active shooter? I don't believe in guns. I don't have a gun. I don't believe in anybody having guns. I'd like the entire army to be stripped of the gun, guns. I'd like to take all the guns and, you know, sort of incinerate them or use directed energy to, to vaporize them. So <clears throat> I, I think, you know, another thing that um, this entire, you know, the COINTELPRO stalking that they are rolling out again, 
and the Stasi stalking is trying to do is um, they are trying to do um, they're trying to leverage their power and appear bigger than they are because what they're rolling out is literally in most of the cases the absolute dregs of society I mean who on in their right mind has got time to just be stalking around you know out in the streets zooming up and down in cars I mean it must be the absolute bottom of society that they can get to do that um, and then the, the whole idea is that if you ask yourself what have I done you know, or what could it possibly be that um, that annoys them? And that's exactly the sort of chilling effect that they would like to use. Correct. And I, the way to system judo out is every time they annoy you to think, hang on a second, what what was I doing again? Oh, yes, I wanted to bring the FBI down because they're a bunch of, you know, deep captured mafia. Oh, yes, I forgot. I was just doing my grocery. I forgot that I wanted to actually take down the FBI. And the crime Exactly, Catherine, and that's what I was going to talk about too. It's like you figure out what you were doing, and you do more of it, and that's what they think that they are trying that they can stop by hitting us with weapons. Don't they get it that every time they hit us with weapons, we're going to speak out even more? So, if they wanted to keep their activity secret, they might want to stop hitting people with weapons. Stop hitting me with weapons and stop hitting everybody I'm covering with weapons, you know? And then maybe I'll stop writing about it. I won't have any subject matter and I'll go on to something else. I, you know, I really do want to write about, you know, plants and, you know, bioenergy and how we can connect with uh, bioenergy and so forth. And I want to and I will at some point. But I would switch to it today if I wasn't being hit with weapons. I'm going to just interrupt for a minute because I have a question from the chat room and I, I promised I'd pose it to you all. Kiss Me I'm Psychic wants to know what are, what's your opinion and understanding on why they are doing it and is there a type of person that uh, they're targeting? And uh, I, I know we've talked about it before, but this might be a good time to address that question again. So whatever your thoughts are on that. Yeah, There's I think a variety of answers, right? Go ahead, and, and I was just going to maybe the best way to do it. The best way to do it. Their answer. Um, I sorry. I think one of the microphones is off, and then we can hear the echo, and that kind of block will help. Um, I think. Um, I think actually, we all have to switch off our microphone. Exactly. Now the echo is gone. Um, and then um, I, I would suggest we go, we take it in turns and everybody gives their answer because I think all of us are seeing a different angle of the same elephant. So depending on who you ask, you will have a different answer. Some people say, oh, you know, I'm just being, you know, I'm being stalked all the time by the Italian mafia. These are all Italians. Other people say, oh, no, I'm being stalked all the time by whatever, you know, the Polish mafia. Or I'm just stalked by, you know, young women and I'm just stalked by whatever, you know. And who is stalking you and how, what exactly they are doing also varies depending on what program they are running and do you get, you know, any directed energy weapons or do you not get them or do you not get them yet? Do you have any brain interference, neurotech? And, um, and I think my personal opinion is that this is a massive program. This is global. Um, and it involves so many people. They, the one thing I can say is that all of them are making a lot of money off this. And then depending on what scale you look, the business plans will be different. So your gang stalkers will be making a lot of money by just getting paid for it. They'll get actual direct payments, like black payments, I would guess, in cash. I've also heard reports about people being you know, paid such big money that they end up with new cars. So your neighbors, who you know are totally uneducated and absolutely you know, worthless little shits, suddenly end up with massive cars and just you know, stuff, and you don't know where the money comes from. You know, and that's a valid question to ask because that's also what in the olden days when the FBI once upon a time used to fight crime, that's what they would look at. If a government official suddenly had, you know, two houses and, you know, would turn up in a fancy car, the question would arise, how could they, how can he afford a Ferrari or Porsche, you know, if he's on a minimum salary? And the same thing is happening now. People are totally uneducated, are the, you know, uh, their neighbors think that they never had a job in their life and suddenly they turn up in a Ferrari. So where does the money come from? So that's the, and also they get free holidays and all sorts of perks that you can kind of give to people off the books and so on. That's, I've heard all that. Um, and then if you go to a higher level, 
Um, of course, there are the, um, you know, the, the, the arms contractors, the pharmaceutical industry, and to them, I think we're all just guinea pigs and they are making money off us because they don't have to pay for research um, subjects. You know, in the olden days, you need to um, give your consent for human experimentation. That's a lot of admin uh, paperwork. You know, you have to recruit the people, maybe even pay them a little bit. And the pharmaceutical industry just cuts it by using, I would say, the intelligence agency to randomly rape and, and mutilate people and test stuff on them and not have to pay, first of all, for the project, second of all, not have to pay for the injuries, you know, and that's that's how they, they make money by saving money. Um, and that's on the big corporation level. And I would say if you go one level up, we talked about this really big organized crime cartel that's also related to the Vatican operations traditionally as being the headquarters of the biggest organized crime ring. Now, when you're at that level, you are at the supranational level. This is bigger than any one country. And then the question is, how do they make money? And I, I gave my answer, you know, as far as um, Europe and the US is concerned, I said they will be making money by taking down the middle class, taking down all the bright people, eliminating them from society, bringing the country down, and then taking over and asset stripping it. And in the case of the US, I would say that's the resources and the billionaires. And I also named one example of um, Gerald Carroll, who was a billionaire asset stripped in Britain. Um, so that does happen. I think that his case is like a template of what will be happening over and over. And in Europe, it will be the royal households and the loot that was traditionally once upon a time in Switzerland. So that, that's at the biggest level. And then to answer the question, is there a particular profile to the people who are being attacked? At first sight, no, because these people will be just randomly selected, it seems. But the higher you get, you know, already at the um, at the level where you would think this could be weapons testing or pharmaceutical testing, the picture already doesn't hold up because the sex ratio seems to be 70 to 80 percent women. That's the current status of knowledge. There's currently a survey running. Maybe that will change. But that's our best knowledge. Now, that cannot be medical testing because, uh, you know, first of all, weapons testing, you would want to find out how to take out young men. Okay, it's no good knowing for you how you will take out a, you know, a, a woman who's in her 60s or a young single mom, you know, because that's not the young single moms is not what your weapons will have to fight in a war. So why is it 70 to 80 percent women? And then you suddenly realize, hang on, this is not even pharmaceutical testing. This is sex trafficking. So those women, will they have a particular, you know, yeah, they will be then selected because one rich, you know, perverted man buys them off the internet and then they will be assaulted and filmed, you know, for sadistic perverts. So then you would have a bias towards, you know, women who are fancied by some sick bastard. But then if you go to the super, the highest level, um, then I would say, yes, there is something very specific to all the people who are being targeted. Because if you want to take down a country and you want to take it down fast before there's any blowback, you would take out the, the crucial bits in a society, and those are the people with high integrity. So those are the, you know, your best and brightest, but brightest and cleverest is not the people with the highest education, you know, not, not your academics. Um, those will be people of actual genuine intelligence and genuine intel integrity. So if you're, if you're wondering why you're TI, I would say, you know, on, on the biggest scale, and, and the biggest scale de determines the program you know, because it's top down. I would say all of the people are, you know, 90% of the people who are being targeted are being targeted to take down a country. So by definition, they will be the best and brightest. You know. And not only that, Catherine, you, you underlined integrity, and I think that's a huge aspect. Best and brightest with the most integrity and the most outspokenness, perhaps, you know, the most community minded, the most willing to step forward and speak out. Because we become the front line because we speak out, you know, and we get targeted, as you say, you've, you've done an excellent job of laying out exactly who's being targeted and why. And there's, there's a political aspect to it. You know, it's like anybody in your community, even if you speak out about um, pesticides on the neighbor's lawn, you know, something small like that you become a focus for attack and assault because we're living in a, in a, in a world right now that's completely ruled by corporate greed. And all they care about are their profits and their bottom lines. And anybody whom they see as in any way, uh, whom they wrongfully see as threatening them, 
because they're threatening their bottom line by speaking out and demanding changes in how they do things, is being targeted now. You know? Exactly. And you know what? You made a very good um, point. Um, when you said we're the front line, I think that's exactly what we are. We are unwilling or accidental soldiers in a war. And you know, we have never answered any requisitioning call, but we were attacked and we have to fight back. But this is actually a, an attack that is now spreading through the entirety of society. Because ultimately you take down the middle class, not for its own sake, but because you're going for the billionaires, because you're going for the big pots of money. And the other thing I would like to say, and that just prompted, um, you know, your choice of words, because you said um, it's driven by corporate greed, and it certainly is. And I suspect more and more that corporate greed is actually a front for organized crime. And they're saying, oh, this is just corporate greed. And more and more, I think, actually, no, it's not just corporate greed. This is actually the mafia behind it. You are covering up actually systematic organized crime here. And that mafia is in the fusion centers, is in the local police department, is in the FBI, is in the CIA, is in the NSA, is in the DHS. That's where the mafia is. That low that private partner that public private partnership, corporate greed slash organized crime lot, you know. They have their own private businesses and they're getting a ton of money, by the way. They're getting a ton of money by virtue of being also having one foot inside the government, right? And getting all those government grants channeled and funneled to these private corporations and agencies that they're, that they're also a part of, the, the private security companies and so forth, and then using that money to, to run these massive operations. And, um, you know, Karen sent around recently in um, the... Um, the the podcast of a new whistleblower, um, right? I guess all of us have heard of him at this point, who has spoken out about these private security companies. I'll let Karen talk about it. She knows more. Karen, my dear. Uh, yeah, that was the, that was the, me, I can, his, uh, uh, the little, we will call it, Oh no, I can't hear her audio. He was working for a security company in Seattle and that they basically are experimenting on every everyone in Seattle. Uh, targeted. So I did get in touch with him via email and uh, he responded. So we have yet more uh, uh, discussion to to have you know, on this topic. So I don't know a whole lot other than what he was talking about, but uh, if he's genuine, uh, then he, he's yet another very important uh, uh, milestone. So we're very much hoping. Because it's, it's very odd to me that you can speak to these people and it goes in one ear and out the other. You know, I'm just kind of astonished. I have to agree with Catherine that when it first started, whenever it started, it basically was random people and you have to think about the fact that um, there were TV shows in the 80s and 90s that every so often would show somebody in a an apartment building usually in New York City who came to the door wearing tinfoil well mm -hmm. they were always of course uh, um, the the police let's say police went to an apartment and said hey we would like to know what's going on next door and somebody would come to the door wearing a tinfoil hat and they'd roll their eyes like oh yeah one of these nuts well, were they? Or did it start way back then where they're experimenting on random people in big cities, especially? And I thought, dear God, this has been going on for how long that they're frying people in their apartments, you know, because there's no, I'm sorry, there's no other explanation, you know, other than they were doing this to people 20, 30 years ago, at least. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree with Catherine. I think at first it was random. And they were sneaking and doing, there was no, um, no pretense that there's some kind of law that says we can do this. There's no pretense that, oh, we can experiment, experiment on Americans. That pretense came later in uh, purposeful misinterpretation of laws. Um, but I think they did uh, branch out from there because I think first random, and then they said, oh, I wonder what this will do to autistic people. Oh, I wonder what this will do to oriental people. Oh, I wonder what this will do to other kinds of people. So I think there is, uh, I think they do put in orders for certain kinds of people. But I do agree that a lot of the people that are getting hit are usually people who have taken some kind of stand. They have some kind of integrity. They have some kind of 
good character, strong character. And they have decided those are the people we want to wipe out because the people we are getting to do this are the dimwits that we want. These are the hive-minded, uh, greedy simpletons who will do anything for anything that we hold in front of them. Big screen TV, uh, lawn mower, they don't care. As long as you tell them, yeah, it's a, it's a crime, but it's a government-sanctioned crime, and we'll give you money and prizes and maybe vacations. Oh, boy. You know, and they, and they go, oh, goody, 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 goody. You know, and then they go ahead and do it like they had no brain whatsoever. It's just greed. It's just avarice. Um, it, they might as well be big stomachs that just suck up everything, every piece of food that comes by them wantonly because they have no humanity. They have no purpose. And I, I'm sorry, but I call them the worthless eaters. You know, if they have lived in this country or whatever country, whatever civilized country that has a constitution, and they're not aware that hurting another human being for profit is perhaps immoral, then I don't see much hope for them. I think what, the, what these people have done is they've called out all the sociopaths and psychopaths in any society. And I look forward to the point no. that they get arrested and executed because society will be so very much better without them. Yeah, let me, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think it's really great explanations. Let me give you uh, a far, uh, just been thinking about this for a long time. I think you're targeted because you're human. I think they need information on humans, especially bright, talented ones, and they're, they're compiling that in the hive mind. Now, I think that you're human, you're selected because they, can, they think they can learn something from you and you're part of a beta test. I think a more interesting aspect is who's doing this. Now we know that there are psychopaths that aren't human. Uh, they're, they, they're, it's not a mental disorder. These people are perfectly sane. They're just missing a component. And not only can you see that in their behavior, but you can see it through their EKGs, right? You can see it through brain scans. They're, they're missing something. So there's, there's these people. Also, I think there are humans that are corrupted. I think there's humans that either through the media, um, uh, video, I don't know, they're corrupted. They'll do this too. They'll do it for money. They'll do it for any, they'll do it for vacations, TV sets, whatever. I also am playing with the idea that there might be uh, types of human type characters that are interceded. Um, my friend David Beverly sent me a quote from Isaiah, and it was about the wheat and the tares. Um, it's a very uh, interesting uh, quote to me because I interpret a little differently. If, you, if, if, in the final analysis, the uh, calling is going to be between the wheat and the tares. Well, if you're a wheat, you don't turn into a tear. Uh, you have to seed tares in with the wheat to get wheats and tares. So I think there's a component of the population that is raised for this intervention. They're, they're part of the corrupting force. I, I call them, uh, sometimes I call them background people. Uh, they're people who can be used who, uh, by ever, by psychopaths. And I think there's vast numbers of them. So I think there's a lot of those people that are involved in the stalking. Now, what's the purpose? Now, we can think that the purpose is, is robbery, and it probably is. Uh, total takeover, as it probably is. Uh, could be a testing to see how you respond. I think it is a beta testing. Uh, but also, I think the effect could be uh, uh, to force you, because you guys aren't sitting around the pool all day. You guys are targeted. You have to do something. You have to move on. And some of you are, uh, we're talking about practices. We're talking about following uh, religious teachings, 
or talk about uh, growth inducing things that you're going to do. So it seems like you're, uh, that this um, collection of the selected, they're all human because they're not interested in the tears, they're not interested in the psychopaths. They're all humans. They want you to either, they want you to succumb to them. They want you to go down. They want you to either die or be, become totally corrupted by them. But what I think is the other outcome is you can uh, surface out of them for humanity. We have the possibility to see it from a higher and higher and higher perspective driven by agony, dilemma. Because in my studies, in my first book, Post-Conventional Human, what happens when people are faced with dilemmas, they reconfigure their value system to incorporate all those dilemmas. Uh, I think I used the, the, uh, the uh, example of divorce. Uh, a divorce is something that disrupts your pattern for how people are. People grow up, they go through teenage years, they fall in love, they get married, they have families, da 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 da. Divorce comes in. Ah, well, what, what the hell? I've got all these new thoughts in my mind. She wants independence. Uh, she wants this. I, I, it doesn't. So if you, if you hold those things at cognitive dissonance, you just make yourself sick. You make yourself ill because there's two conflicting thoughts in your brain. And people, uh, some people, some people do that. But if you think about it and feel it, you'll grow from that new experience and you'll see things from a different perspective. So what we have here is an entire, we have millions of people being subject to, it's like a dilemma on steroids. It's like the most profound, disrupting, horrible thing that you have to cope with. And if you hold it in cognitive, well, they're doing this, but if you can integrate it and think about it and uh, think about it in developmentally, test-wise, what you're doing, I think that what's going to happen to the selected is uh, there's going to be a large percentage of the selected who are going to see things from a higher level. Now, maybe that doesn't make any sense, but... Uh, from my perspective, that seems to be what's happening, in addition to all the things that you said, in addition to the robbery, in addition to the mafia, in addition to all those things, well, a little different look would be the, uh, the beta testing of you to see what, see what you're going to do. Are you going to succumb? Do humans succumb to this or do humans rise above this? My own personal opinion knowing that we're created, I think, we're created in the image of the divine, I think we rise above it. Uh, I think, yeah, that's a great way to kind of frame the entire subject, Paul. It's very interesting because, you know, behind the the material ways and the kind of regulatory and legalistic ways in which they have drawn people into this program, by you know characterizing people as terrorists wrongfully characterizing them as terrorists and spies and then saying we need to surveil them and then putting people under surveillance which then becomes electronic or microwave surveillance and then becomes you know also farming out to weapons testing programs as test subjects and farming out to neuro experimentation programs for the CIA as black ops test subjects in remote neural monitoring and hive minding and EEG cloning and so on and so forth. In addition to all of that, it could be that there is another deeper agenda going to, you know, sort of squeeze, sort of put the screw on these TIs who are already being targeted in these many different ways to put the screws on them and see which one of them survives and which one of them rises. And seeing it all is a kind of virtual reality game that they can watch on their screens and observe and analyze and make little remarks about and their little logs, you know. And I think that's most definitely knowing the CIA, looking at what they have done over time, reading what they've done with MKUltra, I am 
fairly positive that the CIA is most definitely engaged in nonsense exactly like that. But the great thing is, as you point out, because we are being targeted for our in essential humanity, our essential humanity is indeed powerful and can indeed rise. And I think what we are witnessing among many of us today is that humanity rising and what we're talking about today. So when all of the stuff is thrown at you, you know, and a, a grass trimmer standing next to you as he was yesterday morning as I was sitting, um, you know, at the Olston Park, just in front of the Olston Library, which is just across the river from Cambridge, um, the grass trimmer was standing, you know, making one heck of a sound right next to me and making his sound deliberately to harass me, I just laughed and kept working on my interview with Sherry, which is going to be published soon and which is going to rock the world because it is a bombshell interview. It is a blockbuster interview and the kind of disclosure that is going to come out of this interview is going to change reality as we know it, okay, for everybody. And I invite everyone, once that interview is published, it's like Millicent's article you know, major disclosure, major, major disclosure. And we, it's up to us to, you know, spread the word and get the information out. So so all, all I wanted to say was, you know, so in a sense, it's like tunneling through, tunneling through the worst that they can throw at you and still striving to rise above it. And do, I do want to talk about the, the issue of the divine, because yes, I think ultimately, you know, and I've heard this from many people who are very spiritual and very, um, you know, focused on the divine. Um, they do kind of point you in that direction. And it is a great refuge. It's a sanctuary for all those of us who have that, you know, who have that belief system to, to move into that realm of the spiritual. Because you have absolute comfort and knowledge that, that despite whatever is happening to you on this plane, your spirit is unassailable. Your spirit is indestructible, you know, and you are actually part of a greater and a more multidimensional reality than we currently appear to have access to on the material plane. So it is a source of great comfort and many of us draw from it. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, way of um, actually looking at it because, um, you know, I mean, today we really uh, dived in at the deep end of how, how on earth to, um, what to do about all this and how on earth to fight back. And um, I think if anything, what will come out of this will be um, a huge reforging of our society because we have to. Um, we really have to. And it, we will also reforge ourselves um, in a way that is it's totally different. And um, I think that's a good thing because I kind of fell out of the loop. I fell out of the matrix when the financial crisis hit. That's when I left particle physics and I thought, and then I, I was briefly in medical physics um, for a year and then I left that too and I started looking into systems because I thought something is going badly, badly wrong. Had nothing, but if it had been plain sailing, I would have never actually launched into this research. And I would have never ever come across all the many things I did come across. Actually later, if people give me five or 10 minutes, I wanted to show you some really blockbuster things, which I think are good for the investigation. But meanwhile, on this topic, I wanted to share some stuff with you. So I told you that I, um, I started studying um, complex human systems. Um, already in Oxford because things were going wrong. And, and then I continued. Um, and then literally what I did for over a year, so you can see my folder here. These are almost pinkish articles because I went through all the papers and in the end I settled on the Financial Times. And I went through the Financial Times, I think for a year with a fine comb. And I wanted to make sense of everything. And they were reporting, I mean, of course the financial system is at the heart of it and economy. So I really wanted to understand economies. And the first thing that struck me about the Financial Times is that it doesn't make one bit of sense. You know, it doesn't make, it's like nothing was adding up. It, it was just thinking, how can this be? And at some point, I think I even have it somewhere here. There was a, um, uh, there was a, a, a person who wrote in a letter and said, how can it be? You know, I, I left my Financial Times on, on the coffee table the other day and my wife picked it up and she just read two articles and both articles quoted certain numbers like, you know, so this is how many millions have been spent on, on this and this is how many billions have been spent on that. And his wife pointed out just by reading two articles, you know, it must be a lie because the two numbers can't be the same. They don't tally in the same paper on the same day. Already there was such a big fat lie that somebody coming along, not knowing anything about the topic, could pick it up. So that's what's going on, people. Um, the news, the journalists are lying so much that the lies don't tally even within the same edition of the newspaper, if you look carefully. You know, 
it's like in in, in financial um, reporting or financial news you can pick it up even more easily because they quote numbers so anyway that's one thing but uh, so this is my my research folder and I, I kept the articles that really were important for understanding systems and one I just want to pull out is this is actually um, an article that appeared on the 14th and 15th December 2013 and it's about intelligence the intelligence industry and it's entitled the all-seeing eyes right here yeah. that's an article I kept because at the time I didn't even know I'm at the right at the vortex of this intelligence um, agency but in this article um, a quote stuck to me it's um, it says it's a hidden empire it's like the midnight Sun that never sets you can't see it unless you are there that's uh, a big quote describing this entire intelligence conglomerate it's like a parallel world that's there it's like in Harry Potter you know the platform nine three quarters it's there but you're unless you're part of it you can't see it you don't know it's there and it's the same with the gang stalkers you know the the city surveillance has been there throughout absolutely centuries but you you don't pick up on them unless you're one of them or you're being targeted by them so you know but already reading this article in 2013 they pretty much openly i mean if, if you learn to read between the lines in the ft that article already you know when you talk about you know uh, an empire where the sun never sets it already says all oh, the intelligence agencies are one corporation that's what it says but anyway you know you have to learn how to decipher the bullshit in the financial times but the reason why i brought up this um thing is because as i was um philosophizing about what happens to society when you take down the best and brightest what will it look like you know let's say you don't know about the fact that the best and brightest in your society are being targeted let's say you don't know anything about targeting and there are many people still don't because I mean you know um, a year and a half ago or two years ago I had no idea I was a target and I still didn't know that targeted people exist but my question as a scientist is how can a society tell that their best and brightest are being targeted when they don't know about it and there is a telltale sign because the targeting and the entire takedown of the best and brightest in every field not just in science not just in the press not just in the medical fields in the entirety of society has been ongoing for decades especially in the US and it was a program it was a definite program of dumbing down the schools it was a definite program of fluoriding and sedating and dumbing and degrading absolutely everybody of worth um, and we have to remember that originally the best and brightest did go to America those were the most if you like kick-ass people because they you know they left everything behind started from scratch because they just wanted to build they wanted to have to finally the freedom to build and be away from the ossified corrupt old old boys networks in Europe so America was founded by people who really couldn't handle the bullshit okay they had a lot of power so what happened to America what, what happened and how can you tell that there was a takedown operation and uh, you know I would like to contrast two things like this is what you see all around you and that's the reality that's totally hidden and that will kill you okay so the first thing that's all around you I would like to I'm not going to play the clip because then we get into a copyright issue but I'm going to point you to a it's a music video okay I'm not going to analyze it today I'm just going to point you to the music video I can't play it now but I, I encourage everybody after the show take I think I think the, the length is like two and a half minutes I'll share my screen I'll point you to the video and just take two and a half minutes to just listen to the to the full length and in all its beauty even though beauty is not really the word for this this is a box standard music video but every aspect of the music video kind of the utter stupidity the absolute gormlessness of the music and the the soft sex and the soft porn that's smeared all around it um, is there like amplified 50 times and this video I actually love this video because once when I was feeling really down it appeared in my sidebar you know AI style like the fash up adverts and I just clicked on it by you know by pure accident and it made me laugh so hard I was actually laughing for two and a half minutes and every single time I feel sad I just play this video and I laugh my head off so um, let me just share my screen and actually tell you what wonderful video that is um, because it encapsulates absolutely everything that's wrong with our society and the video in question is um, by Jason Derulo 
All right. So this is the actual title here, the music video. And you know, when when it starts, it's already this bubble garment. I'm uh, sorry, I can't actually play it because as soon as I see the, the you know the colors and the jingle, I already start giggling hysterically because I condition myself to laugh every single time I see this video. But as you go through the video, you know. Here he is, Jason the ruler, with a bunch of you know women who frankly look like prostitutes, and it's all like naked women and you know short skirts, and here you know one guy, all the bitches, and on and on and on and on. It just gets you know worse and worse, and you know these guys just kind of telling the world how great they are. Here, more bitches, you know, green car, and all these women that's absolutely like littered across the car, and so on and so on, you know. So that's the typical music video. And my God, she really amuses me. Um, you know, she uh, absolutely hilarious. She also talks about the Dalai Lama. So you've got to listen to this video. It's absolutely brilliant. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the American intelligentsia as it's presented now in the music videos in front of your eyes. But of course, it's everything but, right? But if you if you think about it like that, like this is the best that America has now got to show the world, right? You will laugh your head off for the two and a half minutes. This otherwise the music video is atrocious. So that's what you see. But what's the reality you don't see around you? And that's what's going to kill you. And that is this. This appeared. It's, it says broken system analysis. This appeared in the Financial Times on the 29th of April, 2014. And broken systems, I immediately had to cut out this article because you know I, I'm all about understanding systems and mending them. And this talks about the infrastructure in the United States. And what the article explains further down here, if you go further down, is that there's a rating, an actual rating that civil engineers have for um, grading all the civil engineering um, infrastructure. So this is airports, bridges, roads, ports, you know, dams, drinking water, transit, and so on. And the rating that they have, they've got one, two, three, four, five official rates, which is A, is exceptional, fit for the future, B, is good, adequate for now, C, is mediocre, requires attention, D is poor, at risk, and F is failing, critical, unfit for purpose. Now, they left out the, the, you know, the letter E, and I wonder what E is. Maybe E stands for everybody in engineering, don't drive over that bridge, take the ferry, you know, <laughs> think of an excuse for your family and take the ferry. So anyway, D already means it's like failing, forget it, it's unfit for purpose, it's at risk, you know. And what do they have? So these in civil engineers rated all the infrastructure in the US and they found that aviation, all the airports are category D, you know, um, all the bridges are category C, uh, the levees, whatever they are, like dams, I guess, um, and waterways are category D, ports are category C, rail is C, and then everything like roads, transit and drinking water is category D. It means it's failing. It's at risk. It's already, you know, it's like beyond requires attention, it requires repair. And this is across the entirety of, of the US. But when you have aviation being graded by civil engineers as D at risk, what this means is that the runways are so bad, if a, if a slightly too heavy Boeing lands, it will tear up the tarmac and it will literally drive itself into the ground and explode. And, you know, you might find this unlikely, but, um, you know, that's, that's what can happen. Um, so that, that is where you can tell that, um, you know, this has been done to an entire country because there's no way that a country of, what, 230 million people can't repair its own infrastructure, that they don't have the people. Sorry, I've just seen your message. Um, oh, is Dave actually coming? Because I thought he, um, he's not actually around. Did you actually hear from him? Uh, I haven't, but I, I was saying we might want to try to call him. Yeah, see, you know, see if he, he see if he responds. Um, yeah. I'll tell uh, you. Call Mindy can try to call him, but you know, do keep going because what you're saying is, is extraordinarily impossible. I mean, extraordinary um, important because what they've done is they've siphoned all the public funds off to social engineering and they're letting bridges and everything else collapse because of stupid things she said like gang stalking you know 
Yeah. But it was social engineering that stole all the money before, you know, being siphoned off for our bridges and, and roads and things like that. Yeah, as, far, as far as Dave's concerned, I, I was so impressed with his uh, blog that you know, if we can get him on for a couple comments now, it'd be great. But I would really like him to at least spend an hour with us. Yes, at least. Yeah, I would what do you think? I would Maybe we queue him up for Maybe next year. Because I really want to dedicate an entire hour to him, you know. And and we already, you know, he's not here. And if we'll, we can really get started. Yeah, that would be a great idea if we could have him on for a whole hour. Yeah. yeah, because I thought that was that was also the plan, and um, because that's what he's got to say is such a bombshell. So if he comes, you know, um, maybe we just, you know, um, so so maybe, maybe what you can do, Karen, is give him a call and then you know. Well, I've been trying to call him, and it says it's not. I've left a couple messages, so I don't know quite what's going on. So that's why I thought if you tried to. Uh, connect with him over Google Hangout. He might be waiting, but uh, I, I have not been able to reach him at this point. But yes, he, you know, it'd be nice if he come on, make a couple comments, introduce himself, and then maybe come on next week great. for a uh, uh, an extended time. Because uh, uh, I will tell the people that Dave basically spent some time at a facility guarding it while they developed directed energy energy weapons. So um, he did come on to uh, basically he, he saw a general go on to 60 minutes and tell lie to a reporter and say that the directed energy weapons were non-lethal. And uh, Dave basically said, OK, that's just uh, not right. That's not true. And so he contacted the reporter and said, look, they were designed to be lethal and they were always designed to be lethal. All they're doing is using them at a lower level. And then claiming they're non-lethal. Well, you know, they're not, you know. So um, he has some very good information that I would love to see him share with people. Well, I we're think trying the to notion of, people, but we haven't been able to quite yet. I think the notion of a non-lethal weapon is doublespeak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, name three non-lethal weapons. Well, rubber bullets kill people. Out. Rubber bullets, uh, knife, uh, club. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, rubber bullets kill people, and they're saying those are not sure. lethal. They've killed people. You know? and, and you know what else is uh, uh, something that the military is trying to pass off regarding non-lethal weapons is that the effects are reversible. I beg to defer. I think we have plenty of evidence to show that the, ref the effects are not reversible. Yes, unless, you can, unless you can reverse death. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, death and cancer and all the other, the myriad of other bioeffects that accrue from the application of microwave frequencies to the human body. Right. Exactly. But um, you know what? Another thing that I was, um, I wanted to report, actually, I totally, totally forgot. So, um, um, you know, I actually, I, in the beginning, I, I had all these plans that we make nice and neat announcements in the beginning, and then, you know, we dived in straight in the deep end, um, which I think was good. Um, actually, one of the things I want to report about, um, two things, and it's all to do with, with fighting back, um, but actually now on the topic of non-lethal weapons, one of the things that um, we're all being shot at is these um, high power, I'm not sure, I think there are some pulsed lasers or something like that, some pulsed um, lasers of a certain frequency, but they shoot through walls, they shoot into your body, and when you have metal shielding, you can hear pang, or little like tsk, tsk, um, just as they bounce off. Now, I was trying to prove that this is happening, and I, I had a video where you can see that it puts a dent into my shielding. I have now taken some time and I edited the video to highlight the dent. I put a circle around it. So when people go to my Stop 007 YouTube channel, there's a new video uploaded where you can literally, the first of the thing is you can, you can see how this gun puts a dent into aluminum. It's totally invisible, but it's an invisible um, bullet, um, if you like, a shot. But if I don't have the metal, it's agonizingly painful because this shot goes into your tissue and it tears through your tissue. So it does micro damage. Um, and already in a previous episode, I showed my hand where you can see the size of a small bruise as this gun was, sh was shot through my hand, bruising me up. 
So that's what's happening. But where the bruise is on the surface, or if it's internal in your in your tissue and you get bleeding inside your tissue, is entirely dependent on the frequency and the wave shape. So, um, you know, it, it is hugely damaging. But one thing I want to say to victims is how can you prove these shots? The way you can prove these shots is, for example, if you put aluminium foil over your windows, or if they shoot through your walls at night, especially, they like to do that. Wrap yourself in uh, or put aluminium around you, baking foil around you, because the shots will bounce off. And when they bounce off, they will make a, a very characteristic sort of, uh, it really sounds like a very fine shot. But now comes the clincher. If you buy yourself an audio recorder, and it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, mine was something like 40 euros. If you buy yourself an actual dedicated audio recorder, the microphones are so good that you can make a, a recording. So you just set it to record in the evening when you go to bed. You have your aluminum. And as soon as this, um, these shots bounce off aluminum, they'll leave a telltale signature. And now this is the clinch I just discovered last week. I analyzed some of the, I analyzed this, the audio file from the video I made where you can see that it's putting a dent in. Um, so you can see that that's definitely a shot, but there's also many shots around me. And when you take the free software Audacity, which you can download for free and is super easy to use, you just drag and drop your audio file in. On Audacity, these shots, because they are created by electromagnetic waves that travel at the speed of light, leave literally like a one bin signal. So any normal process that makes a sound, like you, um, you know, um, um, hit the aluminum foil and it's rustling, will have a turn on curve, a peak and a fall off. And it will be this really irregular noise pattern on, on the Audacity um, noise analysis file. But when it's a shot from an electromagnetic weapon, it will be sharp. It will be just like one, you know, and you have these spikes everywhere. And you can just look at your audio file and everywhere you can see this super sharp spike that's very loud. That's a shot. And sometimes it's a frequency and it's so quiet you can't hear it, but these microphones can pick it up. So when you know what to look for, I ask all the victims, please put metal everywhere. By the way, you can also have, um, you know, um, baking um, pans, like baking trays, anything that's metal, because when it bounces off, it will make this ten telltale sound. And you can use these um, analysis. Um, you can do the analysis yourself, the forensics yourself, if you like. And you can prove that those were shots from these electromagnetic weapons. So I'm really pleased because that's one way to prove that at night you're being blasted with this stuff. And as we said, it's not it's very damaging. And I would tell people, I would tell people that uh, the pans with Teflon are especially good because they are very protective against a lot of this. I don't know. Yes, absolutely. Those um, the the baking pans. I would rec I would second that as well, Karen. The baking pans of any kind. They have steel core in them, and they have a Teflon coating. They're great. They do protect you. They do shield you. So please don't listen when people say, oh, you can't shield at all from this stuff. You know, there's some stuff perhaps you can shield from, but there is uh, the basic microwave frequencies that are being directed at us. I know there's a whole bunch of different kinds of te technology that's being thrown at us, but the basic microwave frequencies you can stop with the Teflon. You can protect right. from. Shield. Right. When people tell you it's hopeless, you can't do that, you can't do this. Just go right through it and find out that you can. We get that shower that, we get that all the time. I mean, even if you go on YouTube and you're real selective about who you watch, it's all gloom and doom, they've got 5G, they're covering you with this, they got, don't go, just go right through it. There's gotta be a silver lining, there's gotta be something we can do and you guys know about it and we're finding out more and more. Right now, Mindy's trying to respond to a shower of solutions, a shower uh, that include, uh, name something, Mindy. Well, uh, we just were told that Ormus is a product that raises your vibration. I'm trying to get back to it here. There's so much in the chat room, it's absolutely impossible to keep up with it all. So I'd like to invite everyone that's in the chat room right now, please, if you have solutions that are working for you, put them in an email to pineconeutopiaportal at gmail.com. We'll review them and post them on the new portals so that everyone can see your solutions, what's working for you, and they can try them themselves. 
it's really almost impossible to glean anything out of the chat room and save it for later. Um, because of the format and out of context, it all, doesn't always make sense. So um, just as for future reference for everyone to use, um, either post them in comments under the video after it's, after it's published, or better yet, we'll put it on the new portal so we can share these solutions and ideas. And the effect, if it has an effect on your, on your perps, how they respond to it, that's an important piece too. Because we're gonna we're gonna go through these, myself and the joint investigation team, and we're gonna try to find patterns, and we're gonna try to formulate hypotheses, and uh, we're gonna do exactly what they're doing to us. Why not? Uh, why not? Yeah, absolutely. At this point in time, it's time to turn the mirror to what they're doing, to tell the world what they're doing, and to also put them under the microscope here, you know? Actually, well, I would remind people, I've said this before, but if you get bright, shiny copper and you put it in the back of your car, it'll reflect the vast majority of these emanations back into their car when they have stopped behind you and they think they're so smart because they're one inch from your bumper and then they start getting their own emanations. But I would say the copper is best uh, shiny facing out. And then if you want to go ahead and paint the interior side of the copper with heat resistant grill paint, so that somebody's hitting you from the front, it doesn't reflect and hit you back again from your own copper. But uh, I love that. I saw people doing their little dances in their cars right behind me, two inches from my bumper, not a thing they could do about it, and they could not back up because somebody had blocked them in. So I will tell you that is effective. I love That's that. That's great, Karen. You've always said that, and I absolutely have to take your advice. Yesterday, I was driving back from Boston, and you know, I was in a tunnel. Actually, I was remembering what you had said, Catherine, about being in a tunnel, and then there are echoes of Diana there, the tunnel, right? The Champs Elysees, and so forth. Um, I was hit from behind by big buses hitting me with heat pushed, bumped into the car as I was driving. And I was literally burning up and I, you know, I was sweating. And you can just imagine, well, you know, sort of charging through a tunnel um, under Boston it, at the, um, you know, at the speed of, you know, 50 miles an hour or whatever, but still that, that's, that's a lot in a tunnel. And, um, and being hit in this fashion. And as I came out, I, I was wondering why I was so hot. And then I realized, no, I was just hit from behind. And these guys from behind, a, a big, big um, bus flew past me with forward air written on it. So you know how the covert ops and cops uh, advertise their idiocy and their evil with their little, you know, uh, insignias and logos and little mottos written on the sides of their buses and vans. And I figured, oh, yeah, that's what you did to me just now. A lot of forward air pressure and forward heat, you know, um, hitting me from behind. Um, and But this would be perfect, a perfect uh, remedy to have in my car. Um, well, I will tell people who do not have a hatchback, go ahead and line the back seat with copper plates. And like I said, put the uh, grill paint on the interior and have the copper plates shiny side face and back of you. But also take some copper plates and put them on the back dashboard and put them slightly angled so that their uh, one side is touching the seat, which is gonna be taller than the back dash. And that at that angle, it should aim this right back up into a bus driver's face. <laughs> That's brilliant. You, I, you know, what, that's, on your uh, on the roof of your car too, but you'll have to be a little bit imaginative as to what to do. You know how to do it. I think um, actually on the roof it's not necessary because the aluminium already reflects. I think most people, even when you hit on the top of your head, it's actually sideways. They kind of like clip your head, so it feels like it's at the top, but it's actually coming from the front. Or what it can also be is that they're shooting in at an angle, maybe because the um, front vent has got some um, views in it. So they shoot it up, and then they use the fact that um, the, the ceiling, um, the car roof reflects down to actually hit you back down. You know, it's bouncing off the ceiling, but the aluminum 100% reflects that. But you can be, hit. I have been hit in my lap by a car driving past because they shot in and then just, you know, it reflected back down. 
You know, in cars, I've actually held my shield up right to, you know, the front of my forehead. And I, I, I hear the shots on my, you know, on the shield, like right here in front of me, you know, like that above my head and a little bit in front. Um, so I've always wondered, is it coming through the windshield or is it coming from the top of the car? Because I thought that was metal. Um, you know, I, for my trip from Florida back up to Maryland, I put what I just showed you, I put a couple of uh, steel uh, pieces on the top of the car, just in case I was hit with drones. And then I have a carrier that I actually also lined with metal inside. I don't know if you can see, let me back off. We can't see your video. We can't see. No, you can't see it? Okay. Mm. We're not but, seeing you, know, you at all. Okay. Um, I, I have one of those luggage carriers that's on top of the car. It's a Thule, and it looks like a surfboard on steroids. Um, and I actually, it's for luggage so that you can keep, you know, enough room in your car for big dogs, let's say. Um, but I also lined the bottom of it with metal in case somebody tried to hit me via drone on the drive from Florida to Maryland. Yeah. So that I, yeah, that I, I, was just a way to put shielding without um, changing your car. Okay. I would like to investigate a little bit if microwave pulse radar goes through some kinds of metal or some uh, thicknesses of metal. Because that's what I've been given to understand from others, from other activists. Um, it well, can't go through metal, I don't think. It can't go through metal. So if you've got the ma a pulse, mm -hmm. and it, it can't. But it, it depends on the wavelength. It depends on what you mean. Yeah, but, that's what I'm talking about. You know, is there a particular range, perhaps, that can go through? Um, the, the obstacle size, um, if, if that's smaller than the wavelength, then, you know, certainly you will have, you know, if you've got the big wave, then of course it can go over, you know, if your, your obstacle is smaller than the wave, I mean, you can have a mental image of the wave just going over, whereas if the wave is really small, it will just reflect back, you know. Ah, I see. Okay, because, you know, I wishy-washy thing but the physics works surprisingly similar you know yeah yeah interesting but you remember how sometimes we have to use layers of shielding we have to use layers of aluminium foil or layers of reflectix i think right? that's, because, that's because first of all the um reflectors so first of all mylar one of the things i find shocking about mylar is that um this mylar that i've bought that's behind me is um, if I if I hold it up um, and I turn the camera, you can see the ceiling light through the mylar. It's that thin because I think that's just a, um, a plastic sheet with um, aluminium sprayed on, spray glued on. Mm -hmm. When you have aluminium baking sheet, um, it can also have small holes. And depending on the frequency with which you're salted, if it's a very high frequency pulse laser, it can still shoot through small gaps that you might just about maybe see with your eye if you hold it up. Or it kind of bounces around, and if you have, um, you know, a small gap between two layers, it will just go through the gap by just back reflecting. I see. You know? I see. And if you have many layers, you kind of cover up all the holes that might arise. But in principle, if the metal is thick enough, it shouldn't. It mm -hmm. shouldn't. No so, it's, it's, so it's not a case of accommodating for impedance, you know, for resistance. So calculating how much resistance is being presented to the wave, and then changing something the intensity perhaps of the beam or whatever um, no. so this is, this is not not how it works because you have a, a so metal you have a crystal lattice so if you like you already have a very closely densely packed layer um yeah. so when you lay off metal that's pretty impervious which is why metal are such great conductors you know um and for yeah. example lightning conductors if you're in your car and your car's hit by lightning, you're safe because it's a fantastically perfect, you know, Faraday cage around you, and the, uh, the you know the current kind of goes around. It doesn't hit you. Um, and also, if you're in an airplane, you know that's aluminium encased, and you know you're totally yeah. right. We were talking about airplanes before we got on the show, and I thought that was a very interesting conversation because we've 
both been hit on airplanes, right? I've been hit on airplanes. And in my case, I saw two agents, young agents, or, you know, agent stand-ins or minions or proxies or whatever you want to call them, uh, sitting across from me and pointing their cell phones at me. And either they were GPS tracking me or they were directing energy at me. But at the end of that uh, particular flight, it was from London to Boston last summer, uh, this guy, who this young guy who was sitting in front of me turns to his dad and said, you know, his dad was, of course, congratulating him apparently on his good job spying for MI5 or CIA or whoever it was who set him on to it, uh, you know, tracking me and hitting me the entire time that I was sitting on the plane. Uh, and he turned to his dad and he said, oh, she thinks it's this, but it's really coming from there. And he kind of pointed up. And I thought it was satellites. He was pointing to the sky, the firmament, whatever. But it could just be after I interviewed Frederick LaRoche, he told me that he was hit from the overhead compartment, from weapons carried in suitcases in the overhead compartment. And I thought, hello, that could have happened to me too. I mean, I have no proof of where that signal came from. It seemed to come from above. So either it came from satellites, because we're up at 36,000 feet up in the air, or it came from the overhead compartment just above my head. So bring a, bring a plate of copper with you and put it in the compartment over your head. That's an excellent plan, like directly above, right? Oh, yeah. And the, and the other people's bags, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant because I was hit on airplanes, and I think the intelligence agencies love hitting people on airplanes because you're stuck. You're even stuck in your seat. You can't go anywhere else, you know. And if the flights are booked up, you can't take another seat and, and you're stuck. And they love it because they can just hammer you and enjoy themselves watching your reaction and so on. But literally having a sheet of copper is great because every time you hit, if you just have it as a, at a slight angle, as, angles, uh, as um, Karen said, you're hitting somebody else. You know, you're hitting, hitting them. Um, it, 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 the overhead lockers that they place this stuff. I think that the uh, I think that the whole system of airplanes. I think that's the new world order. I think because when you go in, you're guilty without, you know, without any trial, and they can have at you any way they want. I mean, they can do cavity searches. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what did you have something? Oh, I thought we had something in from the chat, but uh, it's a lot there. But it's just way too much for me to figure out what to. Yeah, it's hard hard to keep point. up with the chats. You're right. And there are some of these airlines, of course, that are actually functioning as just proxies for the globalists, you know, like some of the airplanes that we've been on, some of us have been hit harder than the others, I think. I think American Airlines is one of them. I think um, Emirates is one of them because I was on an Emirates flight going to India via Dubai and the entire flight I and my daughter were hit while, you know, so we thought we had food poisoning. She was vomiting and uh our connecting flight, when we got on the connecting flight, she was still sick and she was throwing up. So we literally we had to get off the plane. They actually sent a stretcher and, you know, took her off the plane. And I was sick by that point. So I was vomiting in the Dubai lobby, you know. So think about that. I'm being hit. I was hit throughout the flight by somebody from behind wielding weapons and pointing it at me or somebody in front with a weapon pointed backward at me. I don't know. I don't know how exactly I was hit, but clearly I was hit. I did write to the airlines and I said, you know, we experienced food poisoning on your airline, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they said, no, our food is fantastic. We, you know, that we are not liable. And, you know, they completely eschewed any kind of liability. And they said, it, it's not us. It's only then that I kind of figured out I must have been really hit with a directed energy weapon, a portable microwave frequency weapon, I should say, a small one of the kind that Catherine showed us the last time. Very easy to carry these on the plane. Yeah, I was I was hit several times by by a plane and uh, on the plane. And actually, one of the things that I did one time I was on the plane is I actually took this um, EMF field meter, um, and um, when I when I had that, I could show and it's even filmed um, that this thing was going nuts on my seat. And when I got up and I just pretended that I, I want to go to the toilet, so I just, you know, went and I waited until there's a queue so I could stand somewhere else in the cabin. And if I stood somewhere else in the cabin, there was nothing apart from one other point on the plane. And I'm wondering, was that another victim or something? But literally, at first I thought, oh, maybe it's the airplane sending signals. But then you actually, um, I think the way it works is that the electronics, so that it can't be affected, is in an extra separate aluminum encasing. So the electronics that they have to steer the plane is not radiating into the um, the actual cabin. Um, but one of, you know, actually I was thinking we should call up these, um, you know, Airbus and Boeing and ask them exactly, you know, how they are, how they're built. Um, and one of the things, um, 
I, I was also, uh, what I wanted to say is that, um, sorry, it just now escaped my mind. Um, something about planes. Yes, people being hit on planes. I was hit on planes. I, I suspect the overhead lockers for sure. Um, and I really recommend that people take the stuff with them and actually just measure it. Um, oh, yes. The other thing was that um, uh, in the, um, inducing vomiting or urination or defecation is, is a weapon. We have a, pat a patent number for that. We should dig it out for next time. But people are being hit, and um, you know what these. What I also um, uh, suspect, and uh, Ramola and I, we were um, um, musing, could it be that um, actually there are several weapons in the overhead lockers, and they've got a little um, network there, and what people do with their mobile phones is set them off, and you know these little weapons interfacing with a little network, and then suddenly I remembered. Hang on, wasn't it the case that um, not that long ago they allowed Wi-Fi? you know, the use of Wi-Fi and you using internet and the phone on the plane again. Do you remember the time when you were not allowed to use your phone? Now they changed it so that you're not allowed to use your phone during takeoff and landing, but on the flight you are. And I thought that's very kind of them, you know. And they said, oh, that's because so many people complained and they want to have Wi-Fi. And I just thought, really? Because before you could just sell so many more movies by forcing people to buy the movies from you instead of just streaming it from the, their own computers. So what happened? And I suspect what actually happened was that they now want to have these assault weapons on the plane when you're really stuck there um, and, and be able to use that. I think that's why they allowed Wi-Fi and, and mobile phones back on the plane. Yes, and you know, the question also comes up, where are they getting that Wi-Fi signal from? Again, you know, is it from satellites? And we were just sort of speculating about that. It's something to look into. Where is it coming from? I don't know. Do you, uh, do you guys change seats when you get on the plane? On some flights, you can't change seats. Well, oh my God, that's, I used to fly a lot. I'd always change seats, but I guess... They want you where they want you. With, see, they've got to be set up for you. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And they do pre-plan. So, as soon as you book your ticket and you've got your... I say spill your drink or your food or something. Well, that's a good idea. She's, she's so clever. She's <laughs> just the most <laughs> clever person I've ever run into. But then there's... Yeah. You are... It'll be interesting oh, if you get up and change your seats... And then look around you to see if someone else is also changing their seat to get behind you or in a good position. Yeah. Then you ask for more water and you spill it on them. <laughs> That's a good one, Kate. And also, don't don't ask don't ask for a bottle of Fanta or Coke because it's nice and sticky. You know, <laughs> just ruin their clothes. Well, one thing is good is milk because you spill it on them and then they stink pretty quickly. <laughs> good. I see you thought this through. That's great. Yeah. We need a direct connection to Karen for any circumstance. Just call her and ask for a solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Karen, we can see why NSA hired you. <laughs> no problem solver. Ay, ay, ay. Well, we're starting to wind down and it's getting toward the end of our time. So why don't we uh, go around and have everybody uh, give their summation comments. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention that I couldn't squeeze in. We were watching Catherine's video. Who Who's the name of that guy that did the video? Uh, um, sorry, do you remember? Sorry, sorry, say it again. Well, who, who did that video? Oh, the music video? The music video. Oh, God, that I don't know. Anyway, right, you get an estimation of how um, big the problem is when you realize that that video, I just glanced up while you, while you were scooting through it, it had 608 million views. Oh, my gosh. Um, I think I know where the mentality of most of the public is. Right. When you look at the huge numbers on the most ridiculous, horrible videos that are posted on YouTube, you can see where most people are at. It's really sad. Infantile. Infantile. <laughs> it is. But then again, remember two things. Remember two things. Number one, that the, those YouTube numbers are not real. They could take our numbers down, bump those numbers up as a selling point. 
so that the you know that video might only have i don't know two million views but they'll bump it up to 600 million or you know because they want to self-generate publicity and the other thing i want to say is out of those 600 million i think at least a thousand are my views because every single time i feel down i just click on it and literally i start giggling as soon as i hear the ridiculous <laughs> The most infantile thing I've seen in a long time. It's ridiculous. With the with the with the women and the green car cars and women and oh my god. We have to, we have to get out of this matrix. It's too silly. On video, it's great. But it does bring up a good point that I just want to share real quickly. I think that laughter is really good medicine. You know, use it as a spiritual practice. So anytime they get you and you need to get out of it quick, have some sources of things that make you laugh out loud, you know, rolling on the floor laughing because it's got, you know, it helps. It, it, well, anything you can it, find it, and kind of line up and stack up so you can easily get to it. Absolutely. Yes, you'd mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned earlier and watching old movies, like old comedies or something like that. I think that's a really great idea. Yeah. I used to have a, I'm not an actor, but uh, I had things in my mind that could make me cry. Uh, we should have things in our mind that can make us laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, just start, get into a habit of making fun of people. Yeah. You know that crisis actor video we saw the last time? That sort of makes me laugh each time I look at it. Oh yes, me too. And it's you know so incredibly well done. Gosh, I, I wish I could I could show you one thing because there's um I, I, I maybe I can put it on. Right, I'm getting echo. I think oh, let me Sorry, it's it's you know what I was thinking. Um, I was actually thinking there should be an Oscar for the best crisis actor. You know, it's like the Oscar for the best crisis actor goes to, and then you would have you know a lineup of four current terrorist events. You know, with the best crisis actor. But you, you know, know there, actor, there was that. There was a group of uh, a guy who used to call himself uh, Red Pill Revolution. Red Pill Revolution. He's TMR now, but he doesn't make very many videos. Uh, what he got together was uh, a bunch of other uh, freelance, like journalist kind of people, uh, and they came in and they did an award ceremony for the best crisis actor, the best plot in a crisis uh, thing, the the best uh, uh, music, and you know they they had the whole thing laid out, and they would name the nominees, nominees. Uh, and then this, this, the winner is, and then they give it. They, so I think that's a brilliant thing yeah. to do. Uh, they only did it one year, and then the, 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 the journalists involved got into issues with one another. I'm sure they were corrupted. And they all kind of fell apart. We could come up with, a thing to do. And we could come up with so many different categories too, such as the best lie, the best lying head of an intelligence agency, or the best lying journalist. You know, the best, yeah. um, the best journalist, for, for the best distortion and reportage from a journalist, from a so-called journalist. Yeah. The best perjurer in front of Congress. <laughs> yeah. um, you do that for the whole. You know, uh, it's. That's mm -hmm. got infinite potential. We it does. Yeah. Like that. Right, maybe we need a maybe we need a portal on the portal for best <laughs> comedy. Oh, Just send yeah. in your selections, yeah. and we'll make a place where we can gather things that make us laugh. That's a great idea. So let's, let's go around and kind of sign off. Um, Karen, if you'd like to start off. Uh, I still haven't got a, an image in my mind that we can put up for this. So. Well, I tell you what, we could find the meme, and I don't. I hope this. But one thing that has always made me laugh: there's a meme out there of Helen, her Boston Terrier, <laughs> at very lovingly, very sweet. It's a wonderful picture, but somebody put the caption under it: Helen Keller with her favorite cat mittens. So that always made me laugh to think that, I mean, the possibility somebody has told her that this is a cat and she never knew for how many years. 
I, a little bit, uh, a little bit sick, so I'm sorry, but it, that has always made me laugh. But the thing <laughs> is, we do have to keep our humor, and we do have exactly. to, in our own way, find a way to fight back. Whether that's making fun of them, I mean, you do have to consider: is this going to bring more? horror onto you and if it is then don't do anything but if you can take a jab at them it will make a lot of people feel better you know um and try to be clever and try to make it such that uh, you can't get in trouble for it but you put your voice across um you know i'm in full agreement you fight back however you can even if it's psychologically and you know what guys if you're targeted, you are such a threat to these people that they have to send 500 or 1,000 people against you alone. That's how much a threat you are. And that's how scared these people are of your intellect, your character, just of you. Okay? So these are army ants, so we will squish them. So hold on. Okay? Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Catherine. Yes, I would like to um, encourage the fighting back. Um, and, um, sorry, so what I would like to suggest, and that is actually doing system judo on them, because you know how they um, use the movies to just set out all the signaling and, you know, kind of like telling us in advance what's going to happen and scare us with it. And I think we should do the same thing back and use their movies for them. And, um, you know, Ramola mentioned how this is an, an everything is just a game for them. And we're just little pawns. It's like the Hunger Games. And we're just, you know, competing and fighting and they are just watching us. And it's a great game. And the way to fight back, I think, if I might, might share my screen, is um, with the following movie that came out, and it was called Jumanji. And it was about um, a board game where if you started playing, the things that were happening in the game suddenly came true, you know? And in the game, there's one field where suddenly, you know, it says you're surrounded by big spiders and um, these kids who are playing the game in the movie, you know, you can see them here with just like giant spiders suddenly crawling all around them. And this is the board game and it's all just leaped out at them and surrounded them. And I think we should do the same thing. If we are just chess pieces in a board game, we, would, we should be like Jumanji. We should just jump out at them and go after them like these giant spiders and really scare them. And I remind everybody that um, I played this video a couple of episodes back about the head of MI6 reporting some 12 terrorist attacks that they somehow averted since 2013. I don't know which 12 terrorist attacks they're talking about, but I suspect one of them is my court case. And another court case was, I think, Dr. Stephen Frost versus MOD. And it's these court cases, and they're terrorized by us. So we should just jump out at them and terrorize them back. Great. Great idea. That's a great idea. Ramola? Love it. Can't stop that, Catherine. <clears throat> Jumping out of a chessboard and terrorizing them. But you know what? I wanted to say that we really don't have to work very hard because terrorizing the CIA, the MI5, the MI6, the BND, the NDB, the, you know, the on and on and on, all the alphabet soup agencies, FBI and so on, DHS, is very easy. All you have to do is get in front of a camera like we're doing right now and start speaking your mind. Just start saying what you think. The moment you start saying what you think and start establishing your individuality and start expressing your individuality, these guys are literally freaking out. They start sending the planes, the helicopters, you know, the local goons uh, with the FBA trucks and the local lawnmowers and grass trimmers and power saw wielders and so forth and on and on. And then if they do that, just try some conscious breathing. <laughs> That will send them into a tailspin and will make sure that you are safe. Exactly. Remember that uh, Lydia said that they, spend, they send a thousand soldiers for each Lakota Indian. That's, that's, that's kind of what, what they're sending to you guys. They're, they're, uh, we have a funny thing that we always laugh at. I think Madeline Kahn is the most hilarious woman that ever walked. Uh, especially her work with uh, Mel Brooks, who is a master mind control uh, guy. I mean, he's, he's, he's funny, plus his corruption of society is, is, is beautiful, almost. I mean, it's almost uh, an honor to be corrupted by somebody as talented as him. And uh, well, anyway, there's one thing, there's a, 
There's a movie called History of the World Part One. And Madeline Kahn plays a, uh, like a Cleopatra type figure. Uh, she's an aristocratic woman, but she's real perverted. You know, it's a Mel Brooks movie. So, uh, well, they, there's these uh, guys that she wants to protect who have escaped. And one of her handmaidens says, oh, we've got to save them. Uh, if they're caught, they'll be hung. And she says in a real sly voice, not necessarily. <laughs> so anytime, anytime she or I say, no, not necessarily, we laugh because we think of the thing. Anyway, you have to be there. <laughs> anyway, so, so much for the uh, Techno Crime Fighter Forum 21. I hope this has been useful to people. I'm sure it has. It's it's always an honor for, for Mindy and I to spend time with this joint investigation team. They're all wonderful, intelligent, humorous, uh, delightful people. I can't think of another way that I'd rather spend a Thursday morning uh, having them in my living room talking to me and, and trying to do some good in the world. So thank you very much. Uh, this is the end. Uh, take care.